The Holy Gospel from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, and we begin reading at verse 13. Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is to be thrown out and trampled upon underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built upon a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches others will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, except your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. It's good for us once in a while to practice what some people have called a second naivete, meaning that we, when we hear the words of Jesus, we deliberately push aside all that we know, all that we have understood, and we try to hear them as though for the first time. A second naivete. When we do that, those words of Jesus, which we have become so familiar with, and we probably may even have them on plaques, and we pass by them, and they become just sort of wallpaper, Maybe those words would jump out at us because of what they actually say. They are too extravagant. They are over the top. But because they are so familiar, we do not hear how unusual and radical they are. Who of you would ever think that if you are broken in spirit, or if you're a nobody that people seem to ignore too easily, or if people revile you and speak all manner of evil against you, that you are blessed. We wouldn't hardly think that in a million years. And yet that is exactly what Jesus has said in the Beatitudes when he says, Blessed are you who are poor in spirit, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who are meek, for you shall inherit the earth. And blessed are you when people revile you and hate you and speak all manner of evil about you falsely in my name. You will have grace given. If we were to hear Jesus, as it were, fresh, like a little child listening, oh, this is interesting, we find that he speaks a lot of unusual things. And this is more his custom than the exception. When he comes to a 
some grieving parents who have called out to him, help us because our daughter is dying. Can you help and save us? And he comes and she's already dead and the mourners are there and the people have gathered to comfort the mother and father. And what does Jesus say? The most outrageous thing in the world, she's but sleeping. It's so outrageous that the people in the house start laughing at him. <laughs> what in the world is that all about? Or if you're one of the disciples and one of you is known for your, his impetuousness and sort of putting his foot in his mouth and charging ahead without knowing what he's doing. And Jesus says to him, you are Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church. I can't help but that some of those disciples, they may not have laughed out loud, but they may have scoffed and said, Peter, what's, what's this church gonna come to if we build it upon him? And all of them that heard Jesus say, if you had faith, just a tiny little bit of faith, you could move mountains. Maybe the greatest thing, the greatest insult to the words of Jesus is when they so become familiar to us that we scarcely hear them. They have lost their taste. They have lost their bite. They don't grab our attention as being so unusual so that we think about them and they awaken our imagination. Yes, we need a second naivete. And so if we hear these words of Jesus, you are the salt of the earth. Hmm. What would we notice? Well, what Jesus says there and what he goes on to say and when he talks about and he says, you are the light of the world. You, not me only, you are the light of the world. He's talking about some commonplace things which life in one sense in their day literally depended upon. Salt is so easily uh, bought and used that we scarcely think about it too much, except maybe because we overconsume and it raises our blood pressure too much and we have to cut down on salt because we like it so much. But do you know that in Jesus' day, salt was such a precious commodity because they didn't have refrigeration. And so how are they gonna preserve anything except through salt? Salt was not just an enhancement to bring out the flavors of the food, but it actually preserved the meat or the vegetables that they had. And if you wanted to a kind of almost sort of soap that cleansed and purified, you used salt. And how about light? Well, we take light for granted and we in our day speak almost of light pollution all the ambient light that we have so that we never really see too much of true darkness so that we can never see the glories of the sky because we have so much light, none of that was there. And even the greatest cities at night, what did they look like? You might have even been able to see some of the stars from the center of Jerusalem at night because there wasn't so much ambient light. You could see them. But what did you see? Tiny pinpricks of people with a lantern in their home, walking from room to room. Tiny little bits of light. And so the darkness was indeed dark. And so when Jesus says, you are the light of the world or you are the salt of the earth, he's talking about things that they could relate to and understand. And he's saying such things as you are the salt of the earth. Yes. Do people appreciate what we have to say? Do they appreciate our presence and our, our words and our actions? Say, yes. You bring out the better part of me when you're around in what you say. Yes, you enhance the flavors that I already have that I didn't even appreciate and see and by your presence. I begin to see things that I never saw before. Thank you for the way that you act and the words that you say. And just being there, you are like a light to me. Jesus is picking up something that is very basic for us. And that is the first thing we hear. The basic components of what he has to say here. 
But the second thing we may notice if we listen is that is what he does not say. We're so used to a moral kind of approach to hearing the words of Jesus where he's always saying, you're not this way. You should work hard to become this way. Strive to become this way. That when he talks about, well, you are already, we don't hear it. We only hear it as a command to improve. Become salty. You're not salty enough. You're not flavorful enough. Work hard. But that's not what he says. You are present indicative. It is present now. You already are. And most of us are probably looking around and saying, who's he talking about? You? Not me. No, I'm not the salt of the earth. I'm not the light of the world. My goodness, don't lay that on me. But that's exactly what he does. And he is saying to us, you already are. Why? And how can Jesus say that? Because he could say to his disciples in one sense. Remember how his disciples, he called them. And that was sort of mysterious for some of them. They just got up and followed him. And then they witnessed his miracles and his healings and some of his preaching. And then there came that time when he said, now is the time for you to go out because I got to go to other villages. You go ahead of me and announce what? Jesus is coming? No, the kingdom of God is coming. But why would anybody believe you? Except that you carry something of that kingdom with you and in you. And so he sent them out to the villages and he says, announce that the kingdom is coming, but heal people and cast out demons. And if I were one of those disciples say, where is that in the manual? I don't remember being taught about this. And Jesus would look at me kindly and says, you've already witnessed it. Go out and live it. Because now you are, not just I am, you are. And what happened? You know the story. They came back and they were full of enthusiasm. You cannot believe it, Jesus. We even heal people and we even cast out demons. Why? Because that which Jesus predicted they were living in in the present moment. And so the kingdom came through them and with them, not just that they announced it and say, I have some news for you, put it in your memory bank and maybe someday you might realize it. No, it was a present experience because these disciples were living in that kingdom already at that moment. And another thing, about these, if we heard these words for the first time. It's almost as though Jesus is saying, you won't fail. There will be an impact. You may never know it yourself, but the kind of person you are and the words you say and the things you do will have an impact, I guarantee you, because a city built on a hill cannot be hid, neither can you. If you do and if you live in the awareness of the kingdom now, people will notice. They may never tell you. And it may only be years later that somebody will say, I remember something you said. I remember what you did then. And you'll never realize how much of an impact that made on me. Jesus is saying, you are the light of the world. And the only way that light is not going to shine is if you hide it. He doesn't say become, he says, if you don't believe that you are, then others won't see it. You can hide it. Let me have our, use our imagination for a moment to sort of illustrate what this might mean. Recently we've had, we had the anniversary of the first from uh, 
the Auschwitz labor uh, concentration camp. So that's what comes to mind. Imagine for yourself that you grew up in a family, you were born into a family, you grew up in a family that you knew who you were, and you knew that caring and consideration for each other was inherent in what it meant to be a part of this family. You took it as second nature. And there was a wisdom in that, and there was a joy in that. But let's suppose that your country is overrun, and you are captured, and you are sent to a concentration camp. Who you are, and what you've grown accustomed to, and, what you, and the way you act no longer fits. Now, and you see the results, you were either beat or you were killed if you disobeyed. If you looked at your guard in the eye even, you could be beaten, why? Because it meant one human related to another human. You are nothing. You are just a labor force. You are just one cog in the, in the uh, mechanics of what we want to accomplish by you. And so, in order to survive, you become a different person. And the compassion that once was very natural for you is not there, even for your fellow prisoners. Why? Because there's not enough food and you are hungry. And so you will literally fight and grab and push others for the sake of a piece of bread. But let's suppose that into that camp there comes another prisoner one day who doesn't adopt the powers mindset who isn't intimidated by them so much. And he would look you in the eye and he would look at you until you raised your eyes and looked at his. And then he would say, you are kind, even though you knew that you were not kind. But it is almost as though he is saying that to you, awakened and brought forth something in you that had been buried out of fear. And as you watched him and the way that he related to people, there was compassion and he treated them with dignity. Ah, oh, the authorities quickly saw that. They saw the influence that he had and they immediately knew that they had to do something about it or the whole uh, emotionality of this camp would change. And so they eliminated him. But there were some that says, well, Nothing happens from that. But others said, I remember what he said. He told me once that I was kind. I never would have believed it. But it woke me up. And it brought back something that I think that I've lost. And maybe there are some that believed and in the spirit of that one person continued to be kind and loving. Some people may have even said, they're the salt of the earth. And others would say, they're the light of the world in which we hope. Amen. We will continue with the hymn of the day.